It's Wednesday, the 4th of October, and this is Tutorial 10, Chapter 1. And on the show this week, we're starting a new tutorial of the Maokop Castle image chosen by you guys on the homepage of photowalkthrough.com. And I'll do a final mention of our colour challenge competition, which closes on Friday. Hello. Well, it's back to normality this week. I had some fun last week. I sat in for Chris on tips from the top floor while he's away in Ontario. And I did a show about how to take photos when the weather's turning bad. I'd like to say a quick thank you to everyone that gave me some great feedback on the show. It was my first real radio style podcast and it was an absolute blast to do. You can check it out at www.tipsfromthetopfloor.com And while you're there, check out Jeff Curto's new show. He's sitting in for Chris this week, and he's doing a show talking all about colour. Uh, Jeff's a member of the Photocast Network, and his own show is Camera Position, which is www.cameraposition.com. And in his show, he talks about the visual and creative processes in photography. It's a really interesting show. It's a lot like Brooks Jensen's Lenswork podcast, only more in-depth. Check it out. It is one of my personal favourites. And let's do another quick mention of the competition that's running at the moment. Sorry to keep going on about it, but I believe we've nailed down why some of you have not been able to get your entries to show up in the tag search that I showed you how to do last week. Um, Listener Brian Byers gave me a possible solution, and it seems to be working. If you're one of the people that have tried to enter, but your image is not showing up in the list, it's probably because you've recently created your Flickr account, and you haven't got many photos on there yet. If you upload six or seven pictures to your Flickr account, you should find that your competition entry starts showing up in the tag search. So if you're still trying to enter and unable to, please try that. If you have any trouble, mail me at photowalkthrough at gmail.com and I will make sure that you are definitely entered. Remember the competition closes this Friday, so you've got literally just a couple of days left to enter. And then from Friday, I will be looking for a judging posse. Unfortunately, Chris is out of town, and so I'm going to have to try and impose on a couple of the other guys from the Photocast Network. Um, Keep your eyes peeled for a competition results special show sometime within the next couple of weeks. Tutorial number 10, show number 38. That's approximately 14 hours of video recorded so far. I was thinking recently, it's hard to know when to celebrate. Most shows seem to celebrate show number 50, but I always have to go through and count how many shows I've done in the past to know which show number this is. Anyway, I'm pretty happy to have reached tutorial 10. I had no idea when I started that this would go past tutorial 1. So here's a quick thank you and a big group hug to all of you that are out there watching and joining in. As many of you will know, I like to alternate between covering an image chosen by me and an image chosen by you guys. I keep a little voting section on the homepage titled What's Next, and there you can vote on which image you want me to cover next in the tutorial. Today's image was one chosen by you guys, and it's called Maokop Castle, and it won by 261 votes to 162 votes. This is a local landmark for me. It sits on a range of hills that looms over a rather flat surrounding landscape, and it's visible from my offices. Maokop isn't actually a real castle. It's a folly built to look like a ruin from the nearby stately home, Road Hall. I have a long-term project that I've been working on for a few years, and I want to capture in a series of photographs my home county of Cheshire. For me, Maokop is a very visible part of my surroundings, I've shot it many times, and this is one of my favourites. What I'd like to do with Tutorial 10 is give you two tutorials for the price of one. When I took this shot, I had in mind a high contrast, low colour version of the image. But when I processed it, uh, as much as I liked it, I also felt that it would look good as a black and white image. So I also added the tritone sepia uh, gradient map that you can see here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by doing the low colour, high contrast version. And then I'm going to, over the top of that, turn it into this sepia tone black and white version.
Right, let's get started. Let's start off by bringing back my palettes and we'll turn off those edits so that we're now looking just at the original raw image. So let's just get that nice and large so that we can see it. Right, this is the image as it came out of my camera. It was raw, but I haven't done really very much to it here. Um, a couple of things that drew me to this image uh, um, and made me choose it as one to work on. Um, the first thing that really struck me about it was the texture of the stone and the texture of the ground here. And I also like that there were a couple of lines in this image that led to the castle itself. If you look at the line of clouds here, it leads nicely into the ground and it all, almost makes a line all the way through here. And then there's also this line here that sort of leads up the slope leading to the castle as well. So we've got a couple of really interesting lines that just sort of subtly lead your eye up to the castle. And with the castle set so nicely against the sky, I was lucky to have the sunlight in the right place so that we've actually got... One of the things you see me doing quite often in these tutorials is bringing the levels of the sky and the ground closer together so that when I do the black and white conversion or the dodging and burning or whatever it is later on, the levels uh, uh, allow us to have good detail in both parts of the image. And this has actually already been done for me. In this case, the sky was... Um, uh, sorry, the sunlight was sufficiently bright um, on the building itself that the levels are already in, the, in nice, uh, uh, nicely compatible. Um, now, a couple of things that do strike me about this image. We've got a couple of specks of sensor dust. There's one there, and there's one there. And there's also this little bit of a building down here. It looks like, if I zoom right in, it looks like it's the fascia boards of a of a building. Uh, there's a flat roof building there, and we've got some white fascia boards. And if you look really close, this was taken with uh, my nice Canon 1740 f4L. Uh, but even a nice L lens like that still gets a little bit of cyan, magenta, chromatic aberration around the edges of that there. Now, that's way, way, way too small to be seen in the greater context of the image. That's the full image, and you can't see the chromatic aberration there. But even expensive lenses get that too. So a couple of distracting elements that I'm going to want to remove. I'm going to want to remove that and that, and I'm going to want to dim down that fascia board bright white reflected sunlight there. And I'm going to want to bring out this stonework. I'm going to want to bring out the texture in the ground. I'm going to want to make sure that those lines that are in the image are brought up as well. And I think that's probably my entire plan. This was the making a plan stage. Uh, I've mentioned it before, but I think it's a very important part of doing your post-processing is to sit down and look at the image to begin with and decide what it is you're here to do. It is possible to pick up an image and just play with it and play with it until you find something you like. But that's that's really not what I would call making art. That's That's teaching yourself. It's a perfectly valid and useful thing to do. But um, I believe that if you're, if you're interested in trying to make something intentionally, then you've got to decide ahead of time what it is you're trying to do. So I think that gives us our plan. Let's bring back our palettes and work at a size that we can see the image. And we'll start off just by um, fixing those couple of spot edits that need, need work. So there's this one here. I just zoomed right in on it. It's not huge but it does just need removing. Um, let's just quickly show why. I know that the type of image I'm going for here is um, a high contrast, low color. Um, the reason for that, uh, I mentioned that I like the texture in the side of the building and the texture in the ground. And what I'm essentially going to do is I'm going to bring out all that detail by going for a high contrast. Now, Adding high contrast is also going to bring up the color. Uh, and I'm going to need to take the color back down, because when you add contrast, you also add color. So I'm going to add a hue saturation layer that will bring all that color back down again. And actually, I'm going to drop the color down probably below where it is now, just to give it a slightly... Uh, um, well, the, the, the effect is something that sort of came to me through looking at a lot of different uh, photographers' work. Uh, Kathleen Connolly, I've mentioned a number of times, has a fantastic style um, that that did partly inspire me to do this. Um, this is also partly inspired by a reasonably well-known technique working with lab color mode. 
and I have a tutorial in mind for the future where I'll show you how that works. But essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the detail into the brightness values and I'm going to let the color values just sort of uh, not not blend so much together but but just make them a lot less important in the shot. And then later on when I add the dry tone gradient they'll they'll be completely removed from the shot. So I'm going to be looking almost at doing a black and white in the brightness values and leaving the color just to sort of uh, give a little bit of reality to the scene. I'll make it all very muted though. So going back to working on these spot edits, I was going to show you what happens if we add that contrast. So just very quickly with a curves layer, I'm going to drag the contrast way, way, way up. This is uh, this might look really extreme, but this, believe it or not, is is almost where we're going. So I'm just adding an S curve in my con my curves layer here, and this is kind of how it's going to look. So I'll just press OK on that briefly, and you can see those specks in the sky. This is sensor dust. Whenever you change your lens, if you've got an SLR, you're letting dust into your camera body, which never really was much of a problem for uh, a film camera, but for an SLR, uh, for a digital SLR, your sensor is magnetically charged and is going to attract that sensor dust, and you'll find that it very easily picks up sensor dust on the surface of the sensor, which needs to be very carefully removed and there are a number of methods out on the internet there for removing sensor dust. Uh, before you even consider doing it, I recommend doing quite a lot of reading. Uh, personally, I have bought some sensor swabs um, and some uh, clean room cleaning fluid that I use the, with those sensor swabs for cleaning my sensor. I do do it myself, but if you're at all nervous, take it to a shop and make sure that they're doing it properly. I have heard horror stories about people taking SLRs into the shop and saying they've got dust on their sensor and the guy in the shop just opens up the sensor and wipes it clean with his finger. Don't let them do that. That would be very bad. So, right, I don't want to get into sensor cleaning here, but suffice to say, if it's something that you get these little dust spots like this, they tend to show up on skies. They tend to show up against areas of large flat color because obviously there's no detail there to hide them in. Um, particularly on skies because skies tend to be bright and particularly if you're using a small aperture um, you'll see those dust spots appear. Um, so yeah, do some reading before you go and clean it yourself. So let's just throw away that curves layer because we don't need it just yet and zoom in on these sensor dust spots and I'm going to use the spot healing brush tool which is the one I call the make it go away brush um, and it in this case, I believe it's going to work pretty well. I'm just going to make my brush, um, I'm going to choose my um, soft edge brush, um, and I'm going to make it about the size of the spot that I want to clean. And I'm just going to paint that blob over the top of the sensor dust that I want to remove. Now that's just done that onto the background layer. Um, in this case, for sensor dust, I tend not to worry about edit, spot editing onto the background layer, but um, it is also uh, possible to spot edit these onto a new layer. So if I undo those changes and add a new layer by clicking the new layer button at the bottom of the layers palette here, we'll call this spot edits, if I can type it, there we go. And this time I'm going to say sample all layers because if I didn't do that, it would just be sampling from this blank layer that I've got that I've just created. So sample all layers on the toolbar there lets you spot edit onto a new layer. So once again, just painting over the top of that sensor dust, and we'll do the same thing. Oops, we'll do the same thing for this one. Not so bad that one, and that clears that up nicely. Now there's a couple of other bits I want to just work on. There's a a cloud there that could be mistaken for sensor dust, so I'm just going to wipe that one out. And there's a couple of little wispy bits of cloud just coming up against the building here, so just see if I can zap those a little bit. This incidentally is not an edit that I did the first time I did this image. This is this is something I've seen when I was preparing for today's tutorial. If you look at the original version of this image, ah, now there's an interesting problem, look. This uh, spot healing brush tool looks for a nearby bit of texture to um, paint.
paint over the area that you're going to work on. Um, and what it does is it pulls the colour in from around the edge of the area that you've spot edited. Unfortunately, in this case, uh, it's chosen a bit of texture from the side of the building. So that clearly is not what we want. So in this case, I'm going to try the patch tool, which is usually pretty good. I'm going to just draw around the edge of the area that I want to edit. And then I'm going to have to do this on the background layer. You can't use the patch tool onto um, uh, onto a, a, a new layer like, like you can with the other tool. So clicking inside that area I've just drawn, I'm going to drag it away to a patch of sky that is the right kind of texture. And let's see how that looks. Oops, that looks pretty good to me. Let's go back down to there. Yeah, that's that's reasonable. We got a little little bit of glow around the edge of that bit there, but when you zoom out, that's not really going to be visible. So I think that's pretty good. Um, yes, what I was saying, this is this is uh, these little bit of wispy clouds that I've removed here were things that I saw when I was editing this in preparation for today's tutorial. If you look at the version that I have posted on Flickr, which is from when I first did this post process, I didn't even notice that I had a couple of wispy bits of cloud there. So, as always, doing something twice gives you a better result. So let's go back to my spot edit layer. And this little bit of uh, roofing here, I'm just going to quite simply paint black over it. Um, I'm going to not I'm not going to paint solid black over it. I'm going to paint a uh, sort of semi-transparent black over it. I've got a nice soft edge brush, and I'm just going to once again one of the benefits of using a graphics tablet. You don't have to press very hard. I'm just going to paint black over the top of that, a little over the top of that chimney pot as well there. Just layering it in. If you're doing this with a mouse, remember to put your opacity right down, maybe down to 10%, and just click and drag over it, and click and drag over it, and click and drag over it, until it darkens down to a level that you can live with. So that's pretty good. Uh, that looks like a fairly drastic edit from here, but you've got to remember context. Always go back to the full-sized image to see whether or not what you've done looks okay in context. And in the context of this one, it's a very small part of the image, and it really, really, really doesn't show. So although close up, it looked like a fairly drastic thing, it really wasn't. Okay. So now we've got a, a fairly clean image, a, a, a nice uh, starting point for our, for our work. And the main element of this image is going to be increasing the contrast. So you've all seen me do this before, if you've watched the show before. Um, I'm going to do a curves layer, and just to, I'll, I'll make a quick mention. There are, of course, a number of different ways of doing this. It just so happens that I prefer the blending mode way. Um, so my regular way of doing a, 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 an increased contrast is just to do a curves layer, leave the curve alone and press OK, and then set the blending mode to overlay. And then I'm just going to rename the layer to contrast. We get this layer mask with it. We don't need that. So I can just drag that into the trash and say yes. And that contrast layer there, it's working pretty well for us. It's not, believe it or not, quite as much contrast as I want. I'm trying to ignore here in my brain the color. Uh, the color is going to start looking really extreme and really bad, but we'll fix that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to drag that contrast layer down to my uh, new layer button. And that'll give me another one. Now that really is too much, but I'm going to just drag the opacity of that second contrast layer down to around about 50%. Just gives it that final boost. And between the two of them, that's adding a huge amount of contrast, and it's really made the colors go wild. We're going to fix those in just a second. Um, so just before we do, though, uh, I'm going to just briefly mention a couple of other ways that you could do this. Um, so I've just hidden those contrast layers. Once again, uh, 
we're going to choose a different adjustment layer. Brightness contrast. This might be what most people would start off with. And it doesn't do a bad job, actually. So that's not a million miles different from, from that. Perfectly valid way of doing what we're doing. Just so happens that's not the way I choose. And then, of course, the other way that you most of you be familiar with, if we use a curves layer, you can increase contrast in your image by adding an S-curve that you saw me do a minute ago. Uh, this is an excellent way of doing it if you're incredibly precise with how you edit your S-curves. Um, I happen to prefer the blending mode way because I get the same results every time. I know exactly how those blending modes are going to affect my image. And just as an example, I've dialed in an S-curve there. And we'll quickly compare that with the results of this. Very similar, you might think. Let's just quickly do a window layer comps. And with my contrast layers turned on, I'll make a, a new layer comp. And then with my curve layer turned on, I'll do a new layer comp. And now I can use the arrows here just to switch back and forth. And you can see there is a subtle difference. There's, there's Nothing at all wrong with doing it the curves way. There's nothing at all wrong with doing it the blending modes way or the uh, brightness contrast way. Uh, they're all just many different ways of doing the same thing. So going back to my contrast, uh, that's pretty good. I'm going to just now, before we finish for today, I'm going to just quickly back off those colors. Now, uh, I'm going to do another adjustment layer. Uh, this is going to be a hue saturation layer. And this is going to give us this hue saturation dialog here. Now, I've mentioned this before, but I'll quickly go through it again. Um, we've got hue, which allows us to change the colors within the image. Now, the reason that's happening the way it is, if you look at the color slide, the color bars down here, we've got input color at the top and output color at the bottom. So at the moment, red is mapped to red. If I drag this to the right, I can make it so that anything that was red is now yellow. Anything that was yellow is now green. Anything that was green is now cyan and so on. So that's what the hue slider does. The saturation slider does exactly what you'd expect. It increases or decreases the vibrancy of those colors. And then the lightness slider does exactly what you'd expect. It moves it more towards black or more towards white. And you'll find that also, as it does so, it decreases color saturation. This becomes more of a uh, more of a concern when you're doing this on individual colors instead of the whole image. So let's just move those all back to, back to zero. Whoops. Can't see past my mic to type on the keyboard. There we go. Right. Now, what I actually want to do is I actually want to edit the colors individually. So we've got this drop down here where we can choose which colors we want to work on. Um, and you'll find that as we choose these colors, you can see We've got a little selection uh, widget here at the bottom between our input and output colors. And all the stuff that's between these two little lines in the middle, the darker section, is completely selected. And from the edge of that darker selection all the way out to the little uh, wedge-shaped bits at the ends, this is, this is becoming less and less and less selected as we go. So I can actually drag that up and down if I want and choose which colors I want to operate on. Or we can use the... Um, the eyedropper on the image, just when you've got this hue saturation window up, you can click on a part of the image and that will center this little selection thing on the color that you click on. So here's an interesting one. I'm clicking on these greens here. At least they look green. But if you look where it's centering the colors, they're actually more yellow than green. It's only the context that makes them look green. It's because they're next to more yellowy colors and more browny colors. And they are actually more, more yellow than green. So something to be aware of. These, these blues here are clearly blues. Over here, although we think of a, a sky as blue, this is actually more cyan than blue here. So going back to our reds, um, what I'm going to try and do here, my, my objective here, uh, I'm always looking to reduce and simplify, which is, a, which is a pretty good process to get into the habit of doing. The, the more you can simplify your image, the more you can uh, lead your viewer to see what you wanted them to see. Um, I'm going to just work on the colors 
to try and reduce it and simplify the colors down to just a couple of different colors. So I'm going to start off by um, the reds in this image. I'm just going to add a little bit of yellow to them. Let's just, you see it's working on this sort of brackety stuff here. Um, and what I'm going to try and do is just move it more towards the yellow so that it's it's more matching the tones around it. I don't want too many colors in this part of the image. I do want texture and detail, but I don't want too much color. So I'm just pushing the, the hues of the reds up a little more towards the yellow. Not too far. I don't want to make it completely unrealistic. But uh, And then also I'm going to drag the saturation of the reds way down. Down to about... Just playing with that. About there-ish. Now, um, I've messed with the reds, and I now want to mess with the yellows that are next to them. So, let's just uh, pick sort of... Oops. Don't mean to do that. Let's sort of center on the yellows there. I'm just using my eyedropper to pick a, a sort of a yellowy patch. And then the yellows... Just going to drag the saturation way down. It's going to look a bit extreme because at the moment the sky isn't desaturated at all. So we've got low color in the ground and the, the sky is absolutely bursting with color. So let's just address that. I'm going to go for my blues. And I'm, I, because I want the uh, this, uh, this effect to edit not just the blues up here but also the cyans here, I'm just going to click in that gray area of my selection widget and drag it sideways until we've got the cyan selected as well. So I've got all the way from the end of cyan here all the way up to the end of blue here. And then with that, I'm going to drag the saturation way down. Way, way, way down. Now that's that's really made the image look quite grey. Um, I think when I first did this edit, I probably didn't drag these values quite as far as this. Um, because the next thing I did was to start doing some dodging and burning and some uh, some light work. Uh, and I know that doing those things increases contrast as well. So we've already increased contrast a couple of times. Some of the steps I'm going to take next are also going to increase contrast. And I think probably what I did when I first did this edit was I did that hue saturation less dramatically than I have there and then came back and tweaked them further down later. But um, it's the nature of reverse engineering these pictures when I come to do the tutorials that I can only see what I ended up with rather than the steps I took to get there. So uh, you're going to have to trust me when I tell you that, that was me just, just taking away the layer mask, you're going to have to trust me when I tell you that, that the fact that that looks very grey now doesn't mean that what we'll end up with looks as grey as that. It will, some colour will come back in the next few steps of the process. So um, I'm going to call it a day there. Um, thank you very much for watching this week. Um, do swing by Tips from the Top Floor and check out my show and Jeff Curto's show there. I believe we've got at least one more, possibly two, uh, Photocast Network members taking over uh, Chris Marquardt's seat while Chris is away. Um, they're going to be really interesting shows. Uh, and also check out uh, Jeff's show, The Camera, camera Position, uh, at camerapositioncom It's a really great show, and I promised I would uh, promote some of the other shows that I really like. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for watching this week. Catch you next week. Cheers. Photocastnetwork.com Your photography resource in the potosphere. Photocast Network dot com